All right, good morning. So today I'm going to answer your questions. So I put a couple things out on uh, the community tab on my channel. First one, I work very hard to provide context. Let me be clear. Here's Russia and here is not Russia. Also not Russia, also not Russia. This is not Russia. Does this look like Russia? Black Sea, not Russia. Okay, so this is about as clear as I can make it. There's Russia and there's not Russia. And that's the very first step in understanding what's going on here. Uh, okay, so I put this out and I said, what has not been addressed to your satisfaction on other channels that you would like me to address? I, if I truly do not know, I will admit my ignorance. Let's play. I'll do my best to answer many of these as I can tomorrow. Thanks in advance for the good questions. So here we are, and I'm just going to walk my way through these. And if I know it, I'll try to explain it. If I don't know it, I'll admit that I don't know it. Okay, what are my thoughts on SNMG to exercise Seabreeze 23 23 which is scheduled for 11 to 15 September? Okay, so I have one to admit my ignorance with the very first question. Sorry, don't know. Uh, perhaps you could comment on what direction the various European countries have taken in their support. I've heard opposition is rising in Germany. Does Spain and Italy actually contribute much of value? Britain is shrinking their army, but they are making up for it in other ways. Royal Navy, artillery ammunition production, etc. Also, have you seen concrete steps in the EU countries substantially ra uh, raising production numbers for artillery and supplies that are running that they're running out of? So they can source things. Let's do the, the last part first. They can source things from many different countries, just like Russia is trying to source from North Korea right now. Um, as far as the what do various countries have, I don't think that there's been a lot of shift. Um, so the closer you are to Russia, and this is really interesting because it seems like, ah, let me back up. So the argument that you have from the pro-Russian side is that, um, you know, NATO keeps encroaching on Russia. What, what really happened was the closer you are to Russia, the more you want to flee from Russia because Russia historically has done bad things to you and they probably will again. So who are the most hawkish here are the Baltic states and Poland. And then it's followed by successive waves of a little less hawkish in the middle and then less hawkish in uh, Germany and France. And then you get to England, who's very hawkish. OK, so, I mean, it's it doesn't it's not 100 percent like that, but there's it's kind of like it it loses intensity the further you go until you get to England. Or, I'm sorry. Somebody corrected me the other day when I said England, Churchill was from England. Churchill was the prime minister of Great Britain. But as an American, I I confound those two and just say those interchangeably when I know that they're not. Um, I, I understand the Welsh and the English and uh, you know, Scottish and uh, Northern Ireland. I get that, but I, I confound it. I also uh, irritate my wife by calling all sheets, sheets, whether they're sheets or blankets or whatever. I, I use those interchangeably and I shouldn't. I apologize. Okay, so the further you go, except for Great Britain. Now, Great Britain, the United States, and uh, Russia were supposed to be guarantors of Ukraine's um, you know, sovereign borders when they gave up their nukes in the Budapest Memorandum. And so that may be the cause for that, but it may just be that England has a clearer eye than, say, Germany or France. And France tends to have a very pro-Russian disposition and want to work with Russia again. Germany, at least the East German side, tends to have a real significant sympathy that the rest of the world that has been dominated by Russia has not. Like Poland does not have, Poland has like an allergic reaction to Russia and properly so, where Germans from East Germany seem to have had almost a warm, cozy relationship with, with Russia afterwards, almost like um, some kind of Stockholm syndrome that I don't quite fully understand. Okay, could you analyze the current line of a Republican presidential candidates in regard to Ukraine? Yeah, let me do this very quickly. So Trump is leading, and, and the more that Trump looks like he's politically persecuted, the worse it gets 
for us who want a different candidate because his poll numbers seem to just continue to tick up with that. Behind him, by quite a bit now, is Ron DeSantis. So it's like Trump at 50-something percent, uh, then DeSantis with maybe 20-ish, 15, 20 percent. And then, um, now DeSantis, I'm not sure that I understand exactly where he is. I, I want to pull for the guy, but he has he's been a little wishy-washy on Ukraine, and so he's not my guy. Um, <clears throat> then there's Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, who clearly has no sense of foreign policy. Um, Nikki Haley pointed this out in the debate, and Pence pointed this out. And um, he, you know, I like some of his, the other things that he says, but he also goes off a little bit off the rail sometime into different things where I'm like, hey, maybe you shouldn't repeat that. I'm very skeptical when people are willing to repeat things that aren't really factual, like, oh, I heard this, and they just roll with it. Um, Vivek is very much cut out of a Trump mold, and he uh, seems to think that he can, his deal, and it's not like the Russians are saying, sure, we'll do that. His deal would be give Russia this territory of Ukraine in exchange for um, decoupling their military alliance with China. Why would Putin do that? I like, why? <laughs> like, so I, I don't understand. Like he thinks he can make a deal with Putin on that, on those grounds. It's, it's just impractical. Then after that, you have Mike Pence and Nikki Haley and Tim Scott all with single digits and, um, and then there's a couple people that you probably haven't even heard of, uh, like a governor of a very tiny state that just like North Dakota that we just like nobody even in America knows, except, I mean, unless they're in North or South Dakota. <clears throat> so I would, I would like to see Pence or Haley or Scott get some traction because all three of those are, and you know, the Chris Christie's in there in this mix as well. All of those are very pro Ukraine, and so they're there. It's just that Trump absorbs all the energy in the room, and he's you know, if if Trump was out of the race, it would it would be really interesting to see what would happen. But the problem is that you also have a, a bunch of people who are pro Ukraine, and that sounds weird to say, but because you have a number of them, they're all in single digits, but if there was only one of them that was pro-Ukraine, they could probably pick up 30% easily just by being the only one on that side, maybe even more just because of that. So I, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a long way off, but it's, it's not looking good yet. And I stress yet, give it time. Okay. Perhaps you could comment on Macron's actual effects. I hear stories of him trying to increase French power and influence at our and Ukraine's expense, but I have no way of evaluating it. So first thing you have to understand is that each of these leaders, whether it's uh, Biden or Putin or Zelensky or Macron or Schultz or whoever, they're all following their own interests. And if they're, sometimes their interest dovetails, like so right now, our interest in the U.S. dovetails very well with Ukraine's interest in defending itself. And maybe we see it as, and I'm not just saying that this, this is how we see it. I'm saying maybe we see it as uh, degrading Russia is our interest rather than defending Ukraine. But even if that was the case, and I'm not saying that it is, but even if that was the case, it has the same positive effect of helping Ukraine defend itself. So, but once you understand that each of these leaders has their own interest, then you can kind of anticipate where they're going. Macron and France have like Macron kind of fell all over himself trying to I'm, I'm going to go to visit with Putin. I'm going to negotiate with Putin. Remember the early days of the war? And it didn't work because Putin had already set his face like he's going this direction. But Macron still keeps trying to, you know, one day we're going to have to work with Russia again. I don't it's becoming more it's increasingly difficult to work with Russia again. Because they've made themselves such a pariah. And Russia's not trying to do that anymore. They're rerouting everything and trying to reestablish their own. Like, 
like, okay, I'm not going to play with the cool kids. I'm going to create my own friends over here on the other side of the playground. Like that's, that's kind of what Rush is trying to do now. So I think Macron's been fairly ineffectual. I think uh, he has to decide whether he's standing with the West or he's going to try to be wishy-washy, but he's stood with the West more than he's been wishy-washy in his defense. But I think his, his knee-jerk reaction or his predilection would be to be wishy-washy. Okay, comparison of Herzan and Zavarishia offenses. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure that I'm I'm the guy that should be doing this. Let, let me paint with a broad brush because I'm I'm not a military guy. My military experience is two years of Army ROTC and four years of JROTC in high school, and that's nothing, right? Um, but I will say that what. I perceive Ukraine trying to do is simply hold the line on the northern Herzan uh, front, right? Um, just just hold the line. They have second and third rate soldiers that have gotten very meager training, enough to be competent, but not to be very scary, just to hold the line to prevent Russia from spilling into um Kharkiv, like that's what they're doing there. And then down in the south, that's where the action is. That's where they're putting all their forces. That's where they're bre breaching the first and now second uh, defense lines. And when they break through, and they will break through, when they break through, I, by the way, I, I'm willing to say, I believe that they will break through and make significant gains before the end of 2024. Uh, well, before the end of 2023, certainly. Before the end of 2024, I think they'll have a much better position before the end of this year, I think they'll break through and make it to a major city, a Melitopol or Mariupol or something along these lines this year. Because once they get through these trench lines, they're gonna there's not a lot stopping them on the other side. But this is the hard part, right? So um but all the, they have to concentrate all their best forces in one place to be able to push through. Um, can the model of how media companies works influence their narratives? Can the pressure of reporting the latest news create journalism of lower quality? Yeah, absolutely. Which at the same time loses track of the big picture, a myopia. Yes and yes. Um, so just as a, as a big picture answer to this, if you're trying to be the fastest, you're going to be wrong a lot. I mean, you're, you just you just are because you don't you have incomplete information, and to the degree that you can found uh, commentary with actual news reporting, you're going to be you know if you mix those two. Okay, so what am I what am I doing? I'm trying to find what's actually happening and then trying to interpret it for you. So it's somewhat like commentary. It's not hard news reporting, but I'm relying on hard news reporting. I'm not trying to be the fastest to be the breaking news so that, you know, this just happened. Turn to Gertis. <laughs> like, no, I'm, tr I'm trying to provide context. Okay, here's what happened. The dust is kind of settled. Here's how it, what it looks like. This is what we think we know. And now I could be wrong and go check your facts in other places, but here's what they say. Here's what they say. Here's what they say. And this is what it looks like. So, those that are trying to be uh, cutting edge, like immediate, are in for trouble. Those who are trying to build a huge audience are in for trouble. And they're because they're, when they try to build an audience, I'm about to do, I think the next thing I'm going to do is um, the Solyov uh, Alex Jones uh, clip. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex Jones is like the, the leading propagandist in the United States. He's uh, the founder of Infowars. He was still sued for about a billion dollars for defamation. Um, but he built his audience to a huge on conspiracy theories, right? Some people want to hear that. And, you know, so and the wilder you are, the more likely you are to grow. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes just really factual people grow, but it's a slower growth. And if you want a quick trajectory, be, say, make some wild assertion. Okay, so you're, you're right about how the model changes it. Uh, and chasing the latest news is tricky. So I, I try to depend heavily on major news sources. For something quicker, I'll turn to Twitter, but then I try to verify it with major news sources, and that, that's not always there. Like when the Kirch was hit the second time, 
the enforcer was the first one on talking about it. And then um, Constantine from inside Russia was on talking about it. But there was nothing even printed anywhere in the news. When I, when I first saw it late at night, in late at night Eastern Standard Time in the United States, uh, before I went to sleep and then I addressed it in the morning when things were printed. But it's, it's really interesting how they beat real news to the punch. Okay, at any rate, uh, how do you see the war ending? Will it end in a peace treaty? Will it, will it be like the Korean situation? Will it end up as a hybrid war? Will Russia collapse internally? Will Ukraine, due to lack of Western support, need to give up territory? Will it end up like the situation in the Donbass in the later years of the conflict? Uh, their stay from 2016 to 2022. Just some examples for you to consider. Honestly, anyone who tells you that they know it's going to end like <clears throat> option B or option C or option A or D, they don't know what they're talking about. The reason I say that is you just can't, <clears throat> you can't know. There's too many variables here. Um, and so... Look for this when you're listening to experts. I was I was at um, University of Virginia for a, a conference where we had a Nobel Prize laureate, uh, James Buchanan. He's a Nobel Prize winner in, in economics. Give a talk, and after the talk, the uh, he got a number of questions from the audience, and it was so weird to me. I was just a PhD student at the time. Uh, it was so weird to me because it was like he'd be posed a question and say, "Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know." And you go on to the next question and answer it. And the next question, huh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. You're you're a Nobel Prize winning economist. Like, how do you not know? Like, what hope is there for the rest of us? But people who are actually, like, in the higher tier of knowing things and understanding things, they're very likely to admit their ignorance when they don't understand things because they're humble enough to recognize that's outside their lane. And anybody who tries to tell you confidently, it will end like this. It will end like that. It will end like the other thing. I, I wouldn't try. Right there, I see that as a mark of don't trust that person. Now, do I have uh, hopes of how it'll end? Sure. Do I have an inclination that it'll go a particular way? Sure. Um, but it depends on so many variables that it's really hard to make any kind of real claim here. So, um, I, I, I will say this, I will say that part of the war will be the economic pressure put on Russia's economy and internal what's going on there. And I'm looking, I myself am looking very carefully at what's happening there to determine how the end of the war will go. But I can't tell you what the end of the war will do. So th that goes to the, will Russia collapse internally? I don't think it'll break up or splinter into multiple pieces, but I don't know that. I mean, it could. I mean, like I've heard some commentators say that's the inevitable result. I, I don't know that that's necessarily the case. But what this war has done to Russia internally has been brutal and it's getting worse and it's re-Sovietizing in many ways. And it's pretty clear about that. And what we know about what's happened to Russia since like the Crimean War and after Afghanistan and and like other major wars have really had a significant impact on the authoritarian regimes, whether it was Tsar or otherwise, after war. So I, I'm looking to that because history seems to dictate. I don't know if that helps you. Um yeah, I, so that's what I want to say there. Okay, I'd like you to interview with Constantine. Yeah, I'd love to talk to Constantine. I know some people are uh, not happy with Constantine and say, well, he's just he's just for himself. Well, look, he's, he's, I think, a good guy that's provided a lot of insight that I don't have about how Russia functions. I found him, I was very happy to to be able to see it. Now, he's lived in the U.S. for a little while, and he's from Russia, so he actually can kind of translate what's going on to Western minds that don't understand. Like, if we think that the Russians think like we think, we're, we're silly. I mean, they, they don't. They, they think very differently. Vlad Vexler is also useful in, in this regard as well. And just, you, you have to understand that not everybody thinks or sees the world like you do. 
I'm going to try to put this in the right words. Wish me luck. I wish you luck. People say the Western democracies are dragging their feet and giving Ukraine just enough money to partially defeat Russia, but not really defeat Russia. They're doing uh, doling out the money and the weapons little bit by little bit, ignoring the fact that the governments are beholden to the individual parts, like representatives and people that they represent. Is there a scenario where the democracies could save money by putting out all the money in one big chunk, all the weapons uh, at once? All at once, all the weapons in the same fashion and a training and delivering and just overwhelming Russia and finishing the whole thing. I'm excluding boots on the ground from foreign countries because that's been a sticking point with the U.S. since Vietnam, I'm sure. I don't know a lot about World War II, but I've heard of D-Day and what a big operation it was, but not in detail. I could ask separately whether we're ever going to stop being afraid of provoking Russia, but there's really no point in uh, in you, uh, us discussing that because apparently there's no point in discussing that. <laughs> <laughs> they could they could bomb us and destroy the world and at this point sometimes i feel like they wish they would just do that or they could uh do some sort of other thing which would create some sort of backlash that we don't expect which is probably a whole lot more likely you may say that i'm a dreamer but i'm sure this is not what john lennon had in mind okay so that was a lot um okay so i think i understand the basics of what you're saying should they just give all this at once so what you stumbled on this with the other part with the saying, I could ask separately whether they are ever going to stop being afraid of provoking Russia. So part of the reason that we haven't given all that we give, have given until much later is because Putin has actually done a good job of deterring the West. And I hate to say that. I don't want that to be the case. I wish it wasn't the case. But, you know, they kept talking about these red lines and no cross these red lines. And what we found was these red lines are fascination or fiction or or imagination or or there, there there's nothing really to them and so we were very careful and methodical not to do that we're arming ukraine but we're not at war with russia although uh putin likes to say that he's at war with all of nato even though he's not supposed to say the word war he's supposed to only say special military operation or go to jail um so yeah i mean i think it's a function of we we just uh, We've been hyper careful not to push it farther. Uh, I don't think there's a great nuclear threat. I, I, I honestly, I don't think that there's a great nuclear threat. I think that they, they saber rattle in order to deter. Um, but I, I just, I don't see a scenario at this point that's going to turn nuclear. But to your greater point about giving them all the things that they need right now, part of that is also a function of well what weapons do we have in our inventories that we're willing to give up with an eye toward what if something else kicks off somewhere else um the scenario is taiwan for example but it doesn't have to be there um so germany there's hundreds of american tanks and in inventory in you know uh, american or nato bases that we're just not willing to give the ukrainians because if something pops off somewhere else, we want to be able to, you know, turnkey, let's get going, not turn this into many years if we have to fight. So um, there's that. There's always that. And that's in, in a large degree, that's the right thing. Like you have to take care of your own, like when the oxygen mask falls in, a, in an airplane, when an airplane goes, whatever, what do they tell you to do? Put your own oxygen mask on first and then help your neighbor, right? So that's a right approach, but I wish they would be a lot faster in getting them the next level. Like, okay, you can't use these. What can we give them? How can we fill these holes? How can we get it to them as quick as, as possible? I wish it would go a lot faster. Um, most of the type of conservative that I am, the Reagan conservative, the kind of hawkish conservatives uh, would agree with me. Um, so, I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm trying. Do you think Elon Musk is right to not allow use of his technologies in and around Ukraine? Why do you think he appears to be doing in the side of Russia? Uh, I don't think Elon would say he's on the side of Russia. I think he's he's thinking he's doing the best that he can to try to do right by the world. I disagree with what he did. I think it was terrible that he turned it off and didn't allow Ukraine to, because in, from Ukraine's perspective, they're defending themselves in attacking here. So, um, I, 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 so there's a, a real debate now about how much power is too much power for any one person to have. 
But it, there's a, a greater debate. Like I watched uh, Vlad talk about this and some others yesterday, uh, Anna and, and others. And, and there's a, a real issue here. But remember, you're beholden. I was thinking about this on the way to work yesterday. When you have partners, when you don't have the capacity to do something yourself and you're dependent on partners, you're, you're kind of dependent on the whims of partners. As long as they're happy, everything continues to go well. And if they're not happy or they decide arbitrarily not to do something, and that's, that's where they are. Ukraine doesn't have their own Starlink equivalent, and so they're dependent on this. And so that puts them in a little bit of a vulnerable position. I think um, Musk was, I'm going to get, I'm, okay, so as a rule, I try to give the opponent the best face that I can until they're proven otherwise, right? Uh, I believe he was trying to do what he thought was right. I don't think he was acting as a Russian agent or something along those lines. I vehemently disagree with it, but I think he was trying to balance something, and um, I'm not sure that I want world geopolitics to be arbitrated by him <laughs> like it's not because of him I, I you know i wouldn't trust my next door neighbor to i mean, no no nothing against my next door neighbors they're nice people but i wouldn't trust them with all that power i, I want it to be you know thought through and deliberative and with bodies of wise people rather than any single solitary actor Okay, could an argument be made that the Musk acted as a foreign agent for Russia and as such is required to register for Foreign Agent Registration Act? And if he did not register, he should be subject. So I, I'm just, I'm not going to go to that place because I don't think he did. I think he was just, I, he thought that that was the best thing to do. And I think it was not the best thing to do. I think it was wrong. Um, but I, until we know something like so the danger is that you somebody can you can say anything about anyone right and, and like well musk asked, acted as a foreign agent well, where's the proof let's before we say that let's let's see what the proof is i understand what his action was and i understand what his you know what the effect of the action was but that doesn't mean that he was doing that um Okay, we can all see the effectiveness of consumer drones, which was predictable to anyone who understand tech and how it has progressed. I'm surprised nobody talks about the potential next game changing thousand dollar device, for example, electronic unicycles that can go at 60 miles an hour in total silence while the user has both hands free for weapons and can fit in a backpack. I'm not familiar with um, the unicycles, but I've been talking about drones for a long time and and um, the U.S. government's thinking about drones and thinking about how they can. There's actually a progress, uh, a, a project, as I understand, in place to create enough swarming drones that you could effectively sink the entire Chinese arm, uh, navy before they could actually get into the fight if it was in Taiwan. And that that uh, pro process, and I'm this is a legitimate report, by the way. That process is in the works right now because the Chinese Navy is big, but it's um, it's not uh, long range. And what I mean by that, the U.S. Navy can go pretty much anywhere it wants. The British Navy goes anywhere it wants. Chinese Navy doesn't has a lot more ships, but doesn't have the power to go too far. They don't have the capacity to continue to refuel and do those kind of things. And so... Uh, because of that condition, it's vulnerable to have to stay close. And so it can be attacked by swarms of drones. And like they're thinking through these kind of scenarios because they're paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine. Everyone's paying attention to what's happening in Ukraine. The Ukrainians are learning and innovating. And as they do, the Russians are learning. The Chinese are going, uh, maybe this Taiwan thing. <laughs> Let's think through this. Uh, the Americans are thinking about it. Every every nation that's that has a military that should be learning lessons is is paying attention to what's going on. Okay, how about the question of what NATO can do about the weapon delivery to Russia from North Korea? I don't know what they can do. I mean, North Korea is already the hermit kingdom. It's already isolated. It's all. I mean, there's not a lot that can go there. Maybe. Maybe South Korea can provide whatever the equivalent is and to really 
that tick off <laughs> North Korea and, and, uh, and South Korea has provided humanitarian aid. Historically, they don't they don't like to give um, military aid to those that are actually in conflict, and that that's okay. I get that. Germany's kind of been become somewhat pacifist leaning uh, since World War II, and that's okay. I I prefer that over the 20th century. Um, but that's maybe maybe South Korea can counterbalance. But as far as what NATO can do to North Korea. Um, I don't know, but I do think that, um, yeah, so it, it's, it, that scenario shows me that Putin is actually fairly desperate that, he, that he's going, like, think about this. If you, if you said two years ago, okay, so Putin's going to try to take over Ukraine and the fighting is going to go on for a year and a half or two years or however long. And you would have been like, what? I mean, Ukraine's like this big and Russia's that big. And how, how is that going to happen? And Putin's going to have to get supplies from North Korea. You'd have been like, you no, know, you're lying to me, Curtis. That There's no way that that could happen. But sure enough, that's where we are. Okay, what do you think of the impact of, of No to War Russia YouTube vloggers? Are they out there showing the truth about Russia and are against the war with Ukraine? I believe that they're the leader, uh, they are the leaders for a better future for the Russian people. What do you think? No to War Russia, Russian YouTube vloggers? Uh, okay, so you're talking about something different than what I initially thought. I thought you were talking about like the, the American and and. British and whatever repeaters that are spreading Russian talking points. You're talking about those inside Russia. Leave our leaders the better future. Yeah, there's it's a very small segment that is is willing to stand up in Russia, and for obvious reasons, right? The incentives are very poor, like go to jail kind of stuff. Um, uh, maybe you're talking about some of those that are also outside Russia but are Russian. And whatever. I, I mean, I think they're doing a useful something, generally speaking. Now, if they're now, here's what's going to happen. Um, as Ukraine gains momentum, and let's say let's say by the end of 2024, and uh, Gen, I saw a general predict this, a British general, that by the end of 2024, you'll see uh, Ukraine split the. <clears throat> the, the break the corridor and they'll, they'll be gaining some momentum because there's not a lot behind the once you get past the the entrenchment lines once you break through that there's not a lot of you know to stop them from going wherever they're going to go so uh, once they gain that momentum i think that you'll start hearing more calls from russian sympathizer types in the west saying well we should declare peace now and it'll become more and more as uh, Ukraine gains momentum. And it will look like they're trying to do something like stop the bloodshed, but they're actually going to be uh, helping Ukraine, or no, I'm sorry, helping Russia by helping them get peace before they're off of Ukrainian territory. And that's a negative for Ukraine and a positive for Russia. I, I think that's what you're going to see. But I don't know much about... Uh, no to war Russian YouTube vloggers who are um, in the way that you described it. I, 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 I'm not sure how much, like I, I'm trying to picture these guys in my head and I don't know of a whole lot. I, I know of the pro Ukraine and I know of the pro Russia um, that I normally interact with. Okay. What's the real uh, reason of this war? Wow. That's a great question. Um, uh, most of you, uh, I, I've had a number of you ask me uh, periodically because I, I show, I highlight what they're saying on the pro-Russian side. Uh, say like, yeah, do do one on Mearsheimer or whatever. The, the trick with Mearsheimer is that he sounds eminently reasonable once he lines up his first few dominoes and then the rest of his argument works. Because if you buy these assumptions, then this is a, you, you've already bought the conclusions over here. I vehemently disagree with this assumption, that assumption, and the other assumption here. And so I'm on the opposite side over here. So the real reason is a matter of interpretation, but I think it comes down to Putin is whether he felt threatened 
which is what he argues, or felt like he want, wanted to conquer and reunite the former Soviet Union or whatever it was. The real reason is Putin took actions that kicked off a hot war. And now let's roll back the clock. But why? And that's that's what we're trying to debate because NATO encroached. Well, NATO the countries becoming NATO. If you ask them, they're not trying to encroach on Russia. They're trying to be protected from Russia. So it's like one side says this, the other side says that. But clearly, at the very base of all this, is Russia is a threat. If Russia wasn't a threat, they wouldn't be trying to join NATO in order to escape the threat. And I think Russia has proven that they're a threat again and again. And so if Russia... Part of this is worldview. Russia sees itself as this great empire that it's really only a fraction of what it once was in the Soviet Union and how you know whatever. It's it's not what it has been, and there's a certain combination of we are great and we are threatened in the Russian psyche simultaneously that I think is driving these actions and is there partial culpability from the West? I'm not sure. It seems like there kind of is and kind of isn't simultaneously. Like the Russians will tell you, well, they promised. Well, there was never anything in writing about like, hey, we're not going to do anything about that. Um, was there some kind of verbal discussion? Perhaps. But there wasn't any like agreement. We're not going anywhere to a now defunct Soviet Union who is now just Russia and these other former states who didn't want to be part of it. Think about like Lithuania. Lithuania was part of what was absorbed by Russian, I, I believe, not just the Warsaw Pact. And they didn't want to be under their tyranny. So I think you let, like you want to let people decide if what they want to do about their own freedom. And that's really at the crux of this. Ukrainians want to be free from Russia. <laughs> now, I think you could you could probably split the difference and say any Ukrainians, if you're a Ukrainian and you really love Russia and you want to be in Russia, go get out, go over there, but leave us our land, leave our territory, go go live over there. I'm just thinking out loud, but I don't know. Like if you're in the Eastern Donbass and you're a Russian who loves Russia and what like like do you, the Russians are claiming, I, I think like go. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I don't know that the Russia, that the Ukrainians are going to necessarily, I mean, unless you've, you know, engaged in war and, and now are viable, liable for a war crime, but I don't, I don't think the Ukrainians are going to be like, oh no, we can't lose that person. Go get out. Um, but at the, at the root of this is, is this Russian worldview, which leads to Russian aggression, which led to the defensive acts of, uh, these nations joining NATO in order to defend themselves against what they perceived as a threat. And I mean, if I could summarize, I wasn't prepared for that, <laughs> that particular question to, to think through each of the steps of it. But I think that's, that's a pretty fair way of, of analyzing it. Now, Russians will argue with that or the pro-Russian sympathy will say, you know, it's all the West fault, but they say it's the West fault about everything else. So, you know, I've got a discount that per, uh, perception. Um, is Turkey making a play to become an energy hub for not only Russia hydrocarbons, but perhaps larger play? And will this ultimately help Ukraine via possible levies to pay for reparations after this madness finally ends? Turkey is all about Turkey in the same way that Germany is about Germany and Russia is about Russia and the U.S. is about the U.S. Uh, so you have to understand that Turkey, Erdogan, is it ha, tries to maintain friendly relations with Ukraine and also just met with Putin. And Turkey will do what's best for Putin. Uh, for Turkey will do what's best for Turkey in the same way that Putin will do what's best for Putin. And if you understand that, then you understand, yeah, Turkey's probably going to try to do that. And in trying to do that, it'll probably have a net benefit to Ukraine and other places. Uh, although Russia will think it's benefited, Turkey will clearly benefit, and I think Ukraine will. Just some ideas. Economics. How the Russian economy has trouble collapsing because there is a tolerance for substance, uh, subs subsistence living in Russia. 
It's almost a source of pride that one can live on the basics, like people living in a post-apocalyptic dystopian fantasy portrayed in Western fiction. Another topic could be metaphors for the West's uses, Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or Hunger Games, and how they fit into the concept uh, conception of Putin. Who are the oligarchs, and does their wealth around the world make them unstoppable in the sense that no matter what happens to Putin, the legacy will continue? Okay, the first one, this uh, economics, um, they, they're they proud that they can live on the base, basics like a dystopia. Yeah, that is a real thing. Like they, they are very much cut out of that kind of cloth. Another topic could be the metaphors that West uses. Yeah, they, they use orcs from Lord of the Rings. I mean, I can see how they could use Star Wars or Hunger Game, Games. Um, how they affect Putin as the emperor or, you know, from Star Wars or something along those lines. Who are the oligarchs? Now, the oligarchs, I think, are the key. Um, the people aren't going to rise up and overthrow Putin. But whether it's oligarchs, or FSB, or something along those lines. Those are the people that Putin would actually be concerned about. Like, if he can keep them happy, he can hang out to his power. But if he loses their support, very bad things can happen. Who is Stefan Bandera? What was the Volin massacre? Is Bandera on a Ukrainian postage stamp? Okay, so quickly, Stefan Bandera was a pro-Ukraine nationalist working for the unity of uh, Ukrainian nationalism. Along the way, he collaborated with the Nazis, but his whole goal was nationalism of Ukraine. When Hitler, the day after Hitler turned on Russia, he asked uh, Hitler for Ukrainian independence. Like, like that. His whole life was about this U Ukrainian nationalism. So they chose. I mean, he was a for Ukrainian nationalism, a hero. He also is kind of worked with the Nazis as a collaborator and did some ugly stuff. But they re uh, revere him because of his um, dedication to Ukrainian independence and nationalism, not because of the other stuff. And so that allows Russia to call them Nazis because, see, he worked with the Nazis, this guy. Um, and he worked against the Nazis at periods too, but so you don't confound one with the other, right? Um, okay, much has been said about the incompetence of Russian military leadership caused by Putin's mafia mentality and his need for absolute loyalty. But I've been reading about early modern England and just keep thinking of Queen Elizabeth sending the Earl of Sussex with an army to subdue Ireland, but he was utterly incompetent and came back empty-handed. If I remember correctly, I think she harshly reprimanded him and then forgave him. Lots of episodes like this litter the history of pre-modern kingdoms, so perhaps the natural political structure of non-democratic states is difficult to distinguish from mafias. Wow, what a great question. Uh, so you, you know that, so I teach leadership, right? I mean, this is this is my subject. And when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking like, like spot on, A+. Plus. Um, okay, so James's question was really interesting because in this case, like here, the absolute loyalty. So look around, and in a system where the loyalty is to an individual rather than to the mission, you're going to have problems. Like in our system, our, my loyalty is not to Joe Biden. My loyalty is to the office of the president. Now, there's also loyal opposition to the to the office of the president. That means I'm I'm worried about some things that he might be doing wrong, and I'm going to protest against that. But I'm not like. I'm not trying to violently overthrow him. I'm trying to get course corrected because I'm loyal to, right? So, but the absolute loyalty to an individual is often a very dangerous thing. And and those that are autocratic tend to focus more on absolute loyalty. Um, and so your contrast, or, or comparison rather, it's not even a contrast of the ascending to Earl of Sussex from the Queen, Queen Elizabeth doing that, yeah, and there's there's probably um, it's, that's probably a really good uh, analogy. And so what you want to do is get away from that. You want to be find competence that's loyal to the flag rather than uh, incompetence as long as it is loyal to you. Okay, please explore the corruption, if any, on the Western side. Sure, there's corruption, uh, but the scale of corruption is just dwarfed when you look at what's going on in Eastern Europe and Russia. So particularly in Russia, 
but Eastern, like Ukraine has corruption and they're working it out. And, and I keep, I'm reading article after article weekly. There's a few articles each week of this official was removed in Ukraine. That official was removed in Ukraine. This one is removed. And they're trying to tighten up on the corruption issues that have historically plagued them as a carryover from the system that they were saddled with. I don't know if they would have been if they weren't in the Soviet sphere. Like if they were independent, if they were able to go on their own way and weren't saddled with the Soviet Union, would Ukraine be corrupt? Like would they like because you hear, oh, Ukraine's just so corrupt. I, I don't know that they would have had the same level of corruption if they hadn't been saddled with the Soviet Union, if they had been able to go their own way. Um it's a really interesting question. I, 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 just, I just don't know. Um, but is there corruption on the Western side? Of course there is. Um, you know, like I, so I do this thing in my, uh, in my management class where when we get to the chapter on ethics, I pull up the, um, uh, whatever news, uh, go to Fox or CNN or something, and I'll pull that up and say, okay, this was today's news, this ethical scandal. I, I've done this every year for about 15 years in that on that ethics class day uh, and when we're talking about it. And I've never not been able to point out, look, look at the stupid stuff that, that people are doing. Why are we doing this? We know better than that. We know we shouldn't act like this. Well, but I've always been able to, on that day, find an ethical scandal. So are there ethical issues in, on the, in the West? Yes. Um, but again, they're, they're, they tend to be dwarfed by the other side. Okay, will Ukraine eventually start to destroy Russia power grids around major cities if the Russian shelling and attacks on Ukraine critical infrastructure continue during a harsh winter or continue to hammer Russia infrastructure? I think they're focused on the military, not on infrastructure. And I, I think they would lose some Western sympathy if they were going after the uh, Russian power grids and you know putting uh, civilians into harm's way. Uh, I don't, I don't perceive them wanting to do that. Do you agree that leadership is a blend of fear and respect? No. Uh, is one attribute more important? Yes. Uh, Putin rose to power via respect. I am not sure that I agree with that. I think he rose to power because he was a non-entity who is not threatened by the oligarchs. And there's a lot that's a lot of evidence that supports that. Zelensky started with 31% approval rating. Perhaps he didn't start with 31% approval rating. Zelensky started with a overwhelming majority, and then it dipped down to as low as 25% in like October or November of 2021 before the um, before the invasion approval. Perhaps because he could not command the fear that Putin now provides. Uh, no, that's not. Uh, I, I disagree with a lot of this analysis all the way through. Uh, would you see conspiracy theories in America as driving virtual fear? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's that's very right, Bruce. Uh, if respect is more valuable, how do leaders use it beyond their staff to get elected? Okay, so let's let's deal with your major question here. Do I agree that leadership is a blend of fear and respect? So if you're saying fear, I don't want fear... I don't want people to be afraid of me, but I do want them to understand that there are consequences for what's going on. I want them to know, and I say this in my class, right? If you if you have my back, like in an organizational setting, if you have my back, you get my heart. That's the way to productivity, okay? So showing that I care about you is actually what I'm trying to accomplish. And Zelensky has been masterful at doing that kind of thing. He's not leading Ukrainians based on fear, like, think about how he's uh, dealing with his own people. It's not like that. Now, at the same time, there's Reagan's doctrine of peace through strength. That is, that might be what you mean by fear, but it's not fear like, oh, I don't know, he's a little deranged. I don't know what he's going to do. It's a matter of like, look, you know what I stand for. You know what I said. You, you know where we, where we stand. We're not going to permit this. So here's the line. Please don't cross it because if you do, this is going to be that. And that's more respect, more like... I know that you can do it. One of the worst things that you can be is is um, is have the stuff that people want and be weak. Like the the classic example of this is you, you want to be rich and strong. You don't want to be rich and weak. If you're rich and weak, then other people want to come take your stuff. Uh, now it's not that Ukraine is rich, but Ukraine has what Putin wants, which is Ukraine. 
So in a sense, they're rich in having Ukraine in that sense, but they're also not militarily strong. So Putin will warrant militarily strong. They're far stronger now than they were before. Uh, and so in Putin's calculation in 2022 in February was they're not strong. They have what we want. We're going to come take it. And well, they're finding out that that's not working out so well. But you don't want to be in that place because then you're inviting like you're inviting somebody to come take your stuff and beat you up. <laughs> right. You don't wear a Rolex in a dark alley uh, in a gang infested area. That's that seems like a bad idea. Right. So um, but if you're walking through that gang infested area uh, and it's there's three of you and they and you clearly have guns, you don't have to be, you know, have those outdrawn and like, okay, guys, who wants it? Like, you don't have to be a jerk about it and command fear. You just, like, they'll respect that. Like, bullies respect someone that they don't think that they can fight, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean that they have to demonstrate, have to make fear for those people, right? Like, the, the people that they don't want to fight, they don't have to... Um, try to tyrannize or be make, make the bullies tremble in fear. They just, you don't want to tangle with this. Okay. I, I hope I answered that. I'm not sure that I did, but I tried. Uh, it's easy to have answers. Putin and GOP have lots of answers. That's a kind of not useful comment. <laughs> okay. Maybe too dark. Russian demographics in the context of abducted Ukrainians. Someone, Peter Zihan, maybe, uh, said Russian demographics were even worse than the official numbers because at some point the Russians stopped counting births and started guessing. The gener uh, general benefits of interacting in good faith, dignity, talking about issues, not persons, having standards that can be violated so you can more easily know something's wrong. In the context of Ukraine versus Russia, Ukrainians seem to self-organize rather well. That's true. Uh, work together on the battlefield. I can't imagine this happening without uh, general underlying trust. Russians, on the other hand, seem to be paranoid and distrusting towards others. You want to be in the Russian army? I mean, I, I don't know that I'd want to be in the Russian army. I think I'd like the way that they treat each other is terrible. This is severely hampers their performance on the battlefield. William Spaniel made a video about this and in society and the Russians also seem to distrust their authorities. Paranoia makes them look away when someone flashes a badge. I presume not asking the question uh, of the authorities behave correctly like we Westerners do. I bet that's why the U.S. intelligence knows the content of Putin's mail. Distrust does not make you strong. It makes you weak. Absolutely. 100%. A plus. Very good observation. I assume that a uh, good faith climate also is preferable in leadership. Please exclude, exclude any typos. My autocorrection is in German. Man, that was a fascinating um, understanding of how things work. So yeah, uh, let's go to the, to the start. Uh, context of uh, abducted, yeah, the, their numbers are probably worse than, than they think. Uh, what they're doing is I think genocidal in a meaningful way. I don't mean like Hutus and Tutsis in Africa. I mean genocidal in the sense of swiping these Ukrainian children and then they're, they're planning to raise them in Russia. And that's partly to get them on their side and partly to like deal with the demographics, uh, partly to put a thumb in the eye of Ukraine. Um, and but they've had a history of doing that. Like, I mean, what what they do to the Tatars in in uh, Crimea. So this isn't a new thing. Um, the general benefits of interacting in good faith and having trust, trust, and the self organize organizing nature. Starsky, when I interviewed him, we talked about that. Um, there is something really different culturally about Ukraine than in Russia. They they just act differently. They're always constantly trying to improve things, self organize do the right thing. If you, if Zelensky was assassinated and God forbid that happened, but if that happened, they would continue to self-organize, figure out who's in charge and keep driving on. Uh, Zelensky, I gave him too much credit for early on, but he, he, because I, because I misunderstood that this is, he's a reflection of Ukrainians. He's not the thing moving Ukrainians, but I, He's he's awesome. He's he's been a great leader, been the right man and the right job for this time with what he had to do to try to talk to the West and communicate and uh, generate the weapons and those kind of things. 
but the Ukrainian's character is just, it's phenomenal and self-organizing. There's also far more trust in Ukraine than there is in Russia, as you pointed out. This trust does not make you strong. It makes you weak. Exactly. You don't want to, you'll never get anywhere or do better by sowing distrust or discord within your unit, whatever that is, organization or military or whatever. That's that's not good. Okay. How many Ukrainian casualties is acceptable for 100 square miles? I, I'm incompetent to answer that question. Uh, you failed to mention that there was a spirited conversation about supporting Ukraine at the first Republican debate on Wednesday, uh, 823. I was originally going to say negligently failed to mention it, but that would indicate that you were not careful or not paying attention when in all probability it was by design. Uh, do you not think it was important? Those individuals discussing, no, I did think it was important. I, I just got subsumed by other things. And one of the things that, um, I have found is that when I do something politically about American politics, um, other issues are far more desirable and uh, it's it's viewed very little in uh, on my videos compared to other issues about it. And so I, I tried to discuss um, American politics and what happens in American politics very judiciously only when it clearly is about something in Ukraine. But here it was just actually subsumed by other things. It wasn't, it wasn't that. Um, I've maintained like, <laughs> like there are Republican voices that are like this, but right now they're in the, they're in the minority of the, uh, there's a majority of candidates who have a minority of the actual polling numbers right now. It's, it's a very, strange thing to watch out. Uh, where are your, your priorities? It used to be Ukraine lately. It seems like your views like subs and self-promotion. Well, hold on. What happened? I, I skipped down a little bit. Um, you have a number, uh, you have, a, well, okay. Do I not think it's important? Those individuals discussing Ukraine security could realistically become the next president of the United States. Not important. Top three Republican candidates are not big supporters of Ukraine. That's the bottom line. It makes the Republican party look bad. Black eye, as they say, could this be the reason you've not mentioned it here? No, that's, that's not it at all. Um, you've on a number of occasions brought up the specter of Hunter Biden investigation and how it might affect Joe Biden. Always with the caveat, I'm not saying it's true. Just asking the question. No, 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 no. I'm not doing a tucker on you. I'm saying something very different. I'm saying this is in the news cycle. <clears throat> Here's what, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. This, this is what's in the news cycle. This is what you'll see in American news. Um, and I don't believe from what I've seen that there's any evidence that Joe Biden has been involved in this shady something, but they're investigating it. If it has, if it is a thing, it needs to come out and it needs to be dealt with and you'll have all kinds of political up, up, upheaval in the U.S. And if it has not, it's still something that's kind of bad because it can really negatively affect what's happening in Ukraine because it can be used against Ukraine as a see you drag Biden through the mud and smear him and say he's only in it because of his corruption or whatever else but I'm not saying that okay so I'm saying this could actually be turned on Ukraine uh, I'm all in for Ukraine I'm, I'm not doing that and I'm not doing that to try to smear or I've, ne I've never been out here trying to convert you to become a Republican. That's not my goal here. Um, I think I'm right. You think you're right. That's okay. I, that doesn't bother me at all. Okay. You have on a number of occasions brought up the specter. I just talked about that. Those are MAGA talking points that sound like they're coming straight out of the mouth of Tucker Carlson. Now that's an insult. <laughs> I'm not using MAGA talking points. I'm trying to... Uh, parse and divide here's what's being said and here's what we know and we don't know that what's being said is what's being said here is actually true so I, i've been very careful with that you flippantly said that it's not just fox that's saying that it's not just fox that's saying this uh this new post is saying this was this to assure us that it was balanced reporting was that a joke no, it wasn't, but apparently you don't like the way that I present things. Uh, so instead of talking about what was said in the debate, you chose to go on and on about a dead man who is really not relevant since he left back. Well, that was the actual, that was the prevailing, the big issue of that time. And that's what got, why it got uh, subsumed. Uh, it certainly was not after his death. I found it interesting that you chose to talk about how Russians perceive Stalin, another dead guy, instead of what, what? Okay. 
Uh, what are my priorities? It used to be Ukraine lately. It seems to be views like views like subs and self promotions. Um, <laughs> well, if that's it, then I'm doing a terrible job at it. Uh, now it would uh, it'd be easy to for me to say, don't like what you're seeing, move on, fair enough. But I liked your content in the past, and it seems to take issues seriously. But lately, not so much. I don't know what you're talking about with that I'm somehow shifting gears. I've been working hard for uh, 500 some odd days trying to um, provide this context. So I don't think that anything's changed, but I think you're probably, and I don't know you, but you're probably on the left and don't like that I'm a conservative and you think that I'm trying to conservatively twist something, but that's not what I'm doing. I only bring this up and I wrestle with it anytime I talk about anything political because it does get fewer, like fewer people are interested in that political stuff. But I bring it up when I feel like it is impacting or could potentially impact what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, what is Elon Musk's political stance? Nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, uh, who might he be endorsing in the next election? Uh, no, and it's not that nobody knows. It's that he's. He's got a very libertarian stance, but he's kind of all over the map. Um, does Elon have a lawful right to interfere with the conflict proceedings in Ukraine, even if his tech is being used? If his tech is being used and he controls it, then he has a right. If his tech is being used and it's been sold and contractually um, contractually taken by the U.S. government to paid for by the U.S. government, he has to contractually allow his tech to be used. I mean, it comes to that. Uh, Heart flag, heart flag, heart flag, whatever. Thank you very much. Professor, you're difficult to stump. Here goes nothing. Thank you. What measurable benefit does it give the West to be so passive in their support for for Ukraine versus actively helping Ukraine drive the enemy uh, from Ukraine's internationally recognized borders, using strategic air power, and surgically strike the occupiers? Okay, answer to question one is very easy, and that is that we are, the benefit is, being very confident that we're not tripping a Russian red line causing World War III or nuclear aggression. That's the benefit. Now, that has to be balanced by the negative side, and that's what we're facing. When Ukraine wins the war, what would be some examples of reasonable reparations, spoils of war, and or reparations should Ukraine and its supporters take from the enemy, assuming anything is left worth taking as compensation and reparations? I wonder if the TU-95 covered an entire is just preparatory example for a scorched earth to move to prevent spoils of war from being taken. Well, that won't help because the spoils of war, like John McCain famously said that Russia is a gas station masquerading as a state. And so they have plenty of natural gas and oil and those kind of natural resources that can be used to be pumped and pumped and pumped in for however long to pay for rebuilding. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried about that. I think they will try to scorch earth, but I, I don't, I'm not worried about that. Musk, his Starlink and his influence versus the U.S. government we just talked about. While much attention has been given to the possibility of China invading Taiwan, little if any mention has been made of China walking unopposed into Central Asia. 1997, the first opium war officially ended with the British administration and forces leaving Hong Kong. The second opium war is still ongoing. Since the Russian Federation continues to occupy the Armour region and outer Manchuria, this is land area which was extorted from China in the 1860s during the Second Opium War under the threat to Beijing uh, to set Beijing ablaze. Unlike Russia's expansive claims to its territory, it does not currently occupy. China has fact-based claims with maps going back to the 14th century to land stolen by Russia. How long before we say goodbye, Vladivostok, and hello, I don't even know how to pronounce the Chinese version. I you know, it is possible, but it's kind of an outside possibility, depending on just how 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 much Russia is uh, collapsed at the end of this. If Russia is just in tatters, it is possible that China can decide to do that. There's there's probably not a, a lot of sympathy for Russia after when this is all said and done. And if China were to do that, I, I think um, I, I don't know that the West would stand up and say, stop that. That's bad. I think they would see it as a punitive kind of like, we'll turn the other way or we'll make this concession if you do something or I don't, I don't know. Um, but it's not the same as China trying to take Taiwan. Um, 
And but that this is completely speculative um, that China would be willing to do that or want to do that or whatever. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. It's just it's too far out to be able to say with any uh, certainty. What is the use of uh, of what use is being made of captured Russians? There is, I believe, no prohibition against POWs voluntarily undertaking civilian work in World War II. Britain and the U.S. both did offer so the Ivans uh, offered the Ivans extra food, cigarettes, telephone privileges, and a ration of vodka on Saturday. Um, they sleep it off, and I'm sure they'll be happy to pitch in. I don't know. I I just don't know. BlackRock in Ukraine. Don't know. I, I don't know that either. Um, what is Belarus doing? Are they breaking away from Russia? They may go democratic and then NATO. I would laugh my rear end off. Um, Belarus isn't doing anything uh, of any substance that I can detect. Um, I've been to Belarus. Lukashenko just wants to hold on to power. Um, the, the difference between like Lukashenko and Putin on one hand and Stalin and previous rulers of the USSR is that the former Lukashenko and Putin are more, especially Lukashenko, uh, are more dictators who want to hang on to their own power, where in the former USSR, there was more of an ideology driven um, agenda. And that's, that's a big difference. Okay. Um, so I don't see Lukashenko doing very much. Tell everyone why most yuck tubers uh, creator, you, 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 YouTube creators show and say that the Russian army uses old weapons and their old vehicles. Is it for propaganda hype? No, I mean, they really are using old stuff. Patrick, Patrick Lancaster is covering the Russian elections in the special military operations. How do I feel about Ukraine targeting a polling location full of civilians? I don't like that. If uh, and that that looks like something that has happened, but I'm I'm not sure that I have all the facts. I know a polling location was hit. I don't know who hit it, um, whether it was Ukraine proper or whether it was something else. Um, but yeah, targeting a polling location full of civilians, I don't like. Okay, it's a little bit later. I had to look this up uh, because. Uh, this last guy just he posed a question that I didn't know anything about and I had to look this up. It happened yesterday. Security service of Ukraine involved in polling place explosions in Russian occupied Verdansk. Okay, so what happened? There was a last night there was an explosion at a polling place. So it looks like it was they blew up the polling place. It was a school, it was elections in occupied territories of Ukraine. The voting was supposed to start on September 8th, but the polling place was never open. These explosions are once again caused by the SBU, sources say. According to the data, Russians are now anxiously considering protection against possible new explosions. But it doesn't look like any uh, civilians were actually there. And this was a misleading question by Lou Hammer, who I think he goes by General Armageddon on here, um, where Patrick Lan Lancaster is co covering the ele Russian elections in the SMO. How do you feel about Ukraine targeting a polling location full of civilians? Full of civilians is one thing. Targeting the polling location to prevent this, that's a whole different story. And so your question was misleading, as is most of the coverage that comes from the Russian side. So you kind of prove my point when I talk about Russian propaganda and Russian uh, misinformation and disinformation. So thank you for doing that for us, Lou. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm actually done now. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for the likes, the shares, the subscribes, the coffees, and thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.